today we're going to be talking about pins. Uh, and we're going to approach the subject through a collection of uh, a little assortment of puzzles. Um, some, eh, some uh, you know, so easy just that they just kind of illustrate the concept of a pin and some will be a little more challenging and we're also in between the puzzles, we're going to look at a game uh, played in the early 20th century between Akiba Rubinstein and Mises, Jacques Mises. Um, that being said, let's get started and put the first position on the board. Um, I'll let you guys look at this. This could, should be, the answer should be jumping out to some, some of the uh, more regular tournament players. and. Uh, we're going to be, you know, in line with the general scope of the show, which is to introduce tactical themes um, to the 600, 1200 USCF rated player um, and to help, help said player develop the ability to uh, identify and recognize these themes at the various stages which they occur throughout our chess games. Um, in that spirit, the uh, tactical theme today is pins, and the sister theme, so to speak, will be uh, discovered attack. Um, chosen because it's somewhat similar to a pin optically, but not necessarily mechanically or the way in which it works. But this is an example, an illustrative example of uh, forced mate in one. Anyone want to shout out the answer? Jack. What's going on here is we, black has two pieces pinned. The queen and the knight are both pinned. The queen pinned by the bishop on f3, and the rook is pinning the knight. Um, and for that reason, we can play a really pretty looking move like queen a6 and deliver mate in one. It's against the rules, or it's illegal to recapture with either one of the, the black pieces. So, pretty clear, forceful uh, illustration of a pin. Let's go on. Okay. Whose move is it? It's got to be Boyd's move. Right. Again, another really easy one, just to kind of illustrate and show the properties of pins. Um, feel free. Uh, to shout out any of the, shout out the answers if you guys see them or raise your hand, that's fine. Yep, in the back, Liam. And the queen on b7, or g7 rather. Um, with the bishop move, we unmask the attack of the rook h1 um, on the king, delivering, not mate, but delivering a deadly check, which will uh, allow you to win the queen after. All right, how about here? This one's a little more subtle, not not a one mover. Ah, uh, white to move. One thing we do is identify the pinned piece. How are we going to exploit that weakness? Or identify the piece that can be potentially pinned, right? Creating the pin, leaving black in zugzwang, essentially. You can pick any legal move for black, and white's next move is almost always going to be b6. Okay, This is a thematic uh, way to exploit the pin theme. Um, you attack, you know, attacking the pin piece in general, but attacking it with a pawn is something that you will see in a lot of your games or games that you look over. Okay, seven mate. So that's actually a really good question. Um, what happens if we play knight c5, threatening, attacking the rook with the knight? Um, what we do is follow through with plan A, play b6, and if Black carelessly gets greedy and takes. We do have a checkmate, which, okay, another somewhat easy one. 
white to move. How are we going to use this idea of the pin? King e5, King e5 winning the knight. Very good. He only has one. He only has one. Uh, one option. Several legal moves, but all of them result in the same, same uh, sad way. Uh, you lose the knight um, because it's pinned by the bishop. This is white to move here. Is another easiest one. We're getting closer to the game. Just to point out some features of the, the position, white has kind of a dream position here, right? He's got the black knight on c7 pinned by two of his pieces. How can he exploit that pin? And if, it, if any of you guys remember the opera game, um, it's not exactly the same style of mate, but it's reminiscent of it. On a roll, on fire. That one's on fire. Okay. The knight obviously is unable to recapture because of, of the pin from the c3 rook. Okay. This one's cool and it throws a lot of my students. So it's white to move. What's the best continuation here? Ah, oh, beautiful. Okay. Can't I capture on passant if you play that? You guys not know? No, no. Well, but yeah, I'm, I'm being sneaky, aren't I? Um, why can't he capture on passant in this way? Because very good. Yep, because the pawn is pinned, and that one's kind of you know somewhat counterintuitive. We might yeah. we might not always consider that, but whenever the opponent king is. Um, exposed in such a way and you know a lot of his flight squares are controlled by our own pieces we want to look for super aggressive moves like that okay pins and counter pins white to move and right now black is already in one pin right the rook on the rook on f6 is pinned by the rook h6 to the king how can we create another one Winning that rook. Beautiful. The idea being that now the rook cannot recapture on h6 um, because it's a second pin has been created um, of the rook to the king, to the queen rather. So not good because we lose the queen. Right here there's a small catch small caveat in here um, this one's set up with black to move blacks you know only reasonable move but now my question is what do you guys play with white here you have the rook pinned to the king do we just win the exchange or do we calculate a little bit deeper and and think about the the consequences of what happened what happens if we if we take immediately on e5 yeah. yeah, you attack with a pawn, right, exactly. Yeah, well said, yeah. This way, yeah, winning the rook, keeping the extra piece, um, and a nice centralized pass pawn, which you, you know, imaginably can escort to a promotion with the king and bishop with little difficulty, um, if any. Okay, and now a discovered attack, mate in three. I'll give you guys 30 seconds to work this one through. White to move. Yep. The discovered attack being one in which a piece has moved, unmasking an, unmasking an attack from the covered piece, the previously covered piece. With white to move, you said bishop b6. Yeah, that's an excellent choice. Check. What's your follow up after that? Uh, where and where do you? Uh, uh, well, King, let's say, let's, let's do a blindfold and just say the moves out loud just for a minute, just for, uh, because this one's only a mate in three. Um, can only go to, uh, C8, I think. Well, he can go to E7. Um, 
And if he goes to C8 uh, or C7, there's a forced mate in one, right? With queen um, on, the, on D8. Um, but if he goes to E7, it's a little more stubborn. Uh, how are we going to follow up? So bishop E4 check. Good first move, correct. King E7. Because we're we're two moves away from mate, um, and especially when we have a puzzle where, where it's been, where we know it's a forced mate, um, we can it, you know, I just start looking at, not in this case, but uh, silly moves even sometimes. In this case, that's not required, but um, forcing moves like checks should be at the top of our list of moves we're calculating. Um, and now it should be pretty clear to everybody, right, that there's no way. Um, that you're getting out of mate. Uh, you can give up the queen, that's the only resistance, and it's not really much resistance at that. But but it's interesting, yeah, to, to take that into consideration. Um, that there are that forcing moves, um, even if at, at first we don't see a positive outcome for us, um, they're worth looking at and spending a little more energy uh, doing our best to really calculate um, precisely um, because you can get cool forced mates in the late middle game sometimes. Okay, on to the game. Okay. Between Akiba Rubinstein and Jacques Mises, both players from the early 20th, 20th century, um, Rubinstein especially was one of the strongest players of his day. And we're going to see these games that we're looking at are definitely going to be closer to our ideas of uh, what normal chess looks like uh, as opposed to the Morphe games, which look like you know a strong player playing e4 and just crushing amateurs. Um, here black puts up a little bit of a resistant, a little bit more resistance, um, and we have you know a d4 opening, uh, something a little more tame than, than the previous games that we've looked at. So the first pin of the game, bishop g5. Uh, pretty common idea in these QGD lines. Um, not so popular nowadays, but it's uh, still playable. Uh, one of the main ideas here, besides creating the pin against uh, the queen, is that we want our bishop outside of the pawn chain so that we can play e3 now and not have a bishop a bad bishop confined um, to the dark squares on our first and second ranks. One move or two. Okay, so before c6, c6 is um, again a, a playable move, not the most popular way uh, th for uh, people to proceed in this kind of position. Um, bishop b4, I think, might make a little more sense, you know, just developing your stuff, getting ready to castle kingside. Uh, but one could argue that. Black has some uh, subtle ideas here. Um, namely, he wants to create a pin of his own, but he has to do a little prep beforehand. Um, he wants to pin the knight c3 to the king, uh, but not with the bishop, with his queen. And so in order to do that, he, needs, he has two problems he needs to solve. One, he needs to create a path for her to get to the checking square. And two, he needs to deal with this pesky attack tonight, or this pesky bishop attacking the knight on uh, f6. Um, if the queen moves immediately, then, you know, bishop takes f6 is an option worth considering, uh, destroying the black's kingside pawn structure, making some ugly double death pawns. Um, so keeping those ideas in mind, we look at these next moves, and we see the queen a5 idea played here. Doing a few things. Um, one, breaking the pin. So now the knight is no longer pinned, and if white, for whatever reason, decides to give up the bishop pair, playing bishop takes f6, then knight takes f6 looks perfectly safe for, uh, for black. Um, and for that reason, queen a5 creates the threat of knight e4 for black, um, attacking the pinned piece twice, which is what we want to do. Once you've pinned a piece, you want to just keep attacking it. 
generally speaking. Okay, so Rubinstein gets the general idea of all this, sees that 94 is a threat, and in a position, you know, in a move still played today, we were looking at this on the database. Um, it's got really good results for white, I think 50, 57%. Uh, he plays knight f3 to d2, or knight to d2. Um, Overprotecting that e4 square. Black continues to attack the now not so pinned piece. Um, one, uh, one other purpose to the knight d2 move is that it also interposes and breaks the pin. Um, important to note that. So he creates a little more pressure on that knight c3, and we see a logical move. Um, taking one more step towards completing development, but also um, defending for a second time the twice attack, knight c3. And we see black put his idea into motion. White responds with his planned defense. And with the simple recapture, black Um, Black uses the discovered attack theme. Uh, noteworthy because, you know, some people might, you know, at least notice that the, the e4 pawn is, is um, under attack here and loose, but totally irrelevant because there's a piece of greater value under attack which needs to be saved, so bishop h4 is played. Giving Black time to take another step towards uh, finishing development, getting his king to safety, castling kingside. White follows suit, getting ready to developing his final minor, getting ready to also castle kingside. Um, and here, this is a, you know a class just aimed towards uh, getting everybody used to you know basic tactical ideas, um, and then we'll work a little bit on calculation. But you know we can't look at games without at least thinking a little bit about the middle game plans and and what's going on and trying to understand uh, what each side is, is thinking. Um, and so that being said, here. Um, we can say that white wants to castle, right? It's black to move, but just looking at either side and, and evaluating the position because we're in the middle of the game. Um, we can say that white's plan is, you know, castle kingside, finish development, and uh, continue to make the most of the space advantage on the queen side. Um, whereas black has uh, some more serious problems, he has some development issues. He has a horrible bishop, which has no legal moves, um, no squares available to it because it's blocked on the knight, by the knight d7. Uh, so he aims to liberate. Uh, and as we were looking at this with the engine earlier, you know, the engine is just screaming to play e5 here um, to create some some uh, some lines, open lines for your pieces um, with the idea of knight f6 and um, ed and, and you know put the light squared bishop somewhere. Um, and even knight f6 is probably worth considering here. Uh, and it's safe to assume that black is thinking along the same lines but he is afraid of playing e5 and losing this e4 pawn um, in some line. So instead, so he chooses instead to protect that e4 pawn um, with the idea of playing e5 later, sometime in the, in the immediate future. Uh, the computer do doesn't like this plan. It wants to play knight f6 here and, um, and just develop your stuff. Uh, but he didn't have engines back then, so he played e5. And now white makes a simple decision, um, one that you always, almost always have to make um, when one of your knights on your on your third or sixth rank, if you're if you're black, if you have black pieces, uh, is pinned by a bishop. Sometimes you need to put the question to the bishop, um, which is what white does here, um, forcing black to make a decision whether or not he wants to lose a tempo or the the bishop pair. Question back there? Oh no. Okay. Um, he decides to give up the bishop pair. 
And here, he probably would have been okay to just trade queens. Um, he wants to hold on to his strongest attacking piece um, and dreams of, you know, getting it over to the king side to help that pawn mass and maybe get some attacks going. Morphy makes a move that, you know, may, excuse me, um, Rubenstein makes a move um, that, uh, you know, the engine doesn't recommend, doesn't hate, closes the position. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure the main idea is he's creating those, uh, he's creating space on those squares, uh, on the light squares, on C4, so he can check the, check the king in, in one way or another with the bishop or the queen. Uh, so, the, so he played the C5 move. This was another kind of funny move, but but not completely losing for black. But uh, you know, ostensibly he's re reacting to the threat of bishop e7 here. Um, and white makes the decision to recapture with the rook, with the idea of just owning the d file for the remainder of the game. So this is taking the, the taking advantage of the queenside space advantage that we were talking about. Probably played with the idea of uh, repositioning the queen. Um, falls victim to the obvious tempo gaining move. Bishop g3. Queen get, escapes the attack and we seize control of the D file, or solidify control of the D file. And here, you know, white isn't crushing, but he has a significant advantage. Um, goes for the check, so the idea of creating this battery um, with bishop c4, um, perhaps considering attacking the knight, I mean the, the rook on e8 with a move like bishop f7. Um, Black prevents that with knight e6. He recaptures here, and this was interesting. Um, we were looking at this and asking ourselves, uh, what move looks natural to you guys here? How would you recapture with black to move? I don't know. My inclination, at least, was to look at, at the bishop takes lines, um, which don't necessarily work. If you guys are interested, we can go over it, but it's kind of outside the scope of this lecture. Um, so he chooses to take with the queen instead, giving Rubenstein the opportunity to create the penultimate, the second to last pin in the game. How can we create an absolute pin? An absolute pin being one where a piece is pinned to the king. Well said. Okay. And here black certainly starts to go astray. I, I think if I remember the eval right, white's up significantly, not, not, nothing too dire, but pretty bad, uh, about 1.5 if I remember. Um, but black makes a move. Um, I believe here rook g8 is playable, um, but he sees that his back rank is weak. He plays h6, creates a little luft or air, um, a little flight square for the king. And white creates the final pin of the game, which may not seem significant, but something that we should always, to, one of the most important features in any chess position is, you know, which pieces are pinned and, um, and so on, period. Which, pe you know, which if any pieces are pinned, um, always something that we need to be looking for. Uh, queen c3 not necessarily being the strongest move in the position. I think the, if I remember right, the engine won the queen b4 or something like this. But it, it's cool and definitely good for this lecture because it illustrates the whole pin idea. And here is the big losing move. How can we win with white here? White to win and move with a killer tactical idea. Um, now the pin is a minor theme. This tactical idea is, is actually uh, deflection, or you could 
call it attraction maybe. Um, beautiful. Okay. And now that pin on G7 comes into play. Um, we would like to play G5 blocking that pesky bishop attack, right? Can't do it though. Because the queen pins the pawn. And here my C's resigned. Okay, I have a few more puzzles. Um, and these ones will, will be a little bit little bit more difficult than the first set. Um, so I'll just white to move um, and win, find the winning continuation. Uh, pin is a theme here and I will throw out some hints. These are, like I said, are a little bit more difficult. Um, I'll throw out some hints after 20 seconds or so. Maybe, maybe a little longer if you guys want. And I picked a lot of these just in case you or any players close to you in strength showed up. Um, this one's not necessarily super hard, but, uh, but it's, it requires some calculation, definitely. OK. So a few different important features to note in this position. Um, we have an advanced pass pawn on f7, uh, currently unprotected, but you know, imaginably could be protected if we, we could just discover a protection, you know, by moving that knight to some square. Um, but we also have a super weak back rank, right? We don't have any black pieces really defending the back rank so much. Um, it's under, under defended at the very least. So we can play a crazy move. Um, in line with the theme a lot of, with a lot of the previous puzzles, giving up our strongest piece uh, for a guaranteed favorable attack. Queen takes d6, forcing the c7 pawn to recapture, um, exploiting its, the weakness of its uh, pin to the, to the weak back rank, uh, meaning it was pinned by the rook c2 to the weak back rank. And if we go with the direct line, um, you can get some stuff like this going after after this check. We have some serious mating threats going on. Um, for example, queen takes g6 and mate, right? Or mate to mate and mate. Made on e8 after rook e8. Let's do this one because this is a good example of forcing moves, um, and this is more of a back rank. Weak back rank is more the theme here than the pin, but there definitely is a pin in this position. The f7 pawn is pinned by the queen. Queen on d5 and under attack twice. So. How should we proceed with white here? Um, and, and there's a force to win in here and a small amount of moves. I'll tell you guys what, what it is if you want, but makes it more fun sometimes if we just approach it like it's a game that we're actually playing um, and we don't have a, someone telling us that there's a force to win in a set amount of moves. But the big hint is forcing moves. And when we're calculating these lines in our head, usually they flow pretty easy because our opponents don't have a lot of responses. So what are some ways we can play a forcing line? Queen takes pawn check. Queen takes pawn check. Rook takes, uh, rook takes pawn. Rook, to, uh, rook e8 check. Rook e8 check. Rook f8. Rook takes rook. Rook takes rook. rook uh, uh, right. Rook takes rook. Um, king takes rook. And then we have that classic rook and bishop mating pattern. Uh, Right, so uh, this one's not put in. So, queen takes, rook takes, and again, the back rank is under defended. Got a pretty little mate. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out and participating. Yep, glad you enjoyed it. Hit like, share, subscribe. Thank you.